Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm currently doing my postdoc in UC Davis, but I'll talk about results from my PhD under Rana Tan's supervision in the Hebrew University. And I worked on vultures, and I did a main project with the Euro-Asian vulture that you see over here in Israel in the Middle East, and another side project comparing two species of vultures in Natoshana National Park. I'll focus mostly on the other one, but I'll bring some results from the from the side project just to show you that the general patterns that we see are not just here. And what I'll try to convince you during this talk is basically what uh, John Frixell said, and I think it was said also by others, that we should try to go beyond the statistical models and try to get some insight by integrating different input data. And I'll focus mostly on the long range forays of this movement. And I, I guess this is a captive audience. I don't have to convince you that long range are important for various aspects. And as we've seen here throughout the talks, they're usually studied either in the context of dispersal or in the context of migration. And if it's a long process, a long distance uh, movement, but on a short temporal scale, it's usually studied in the context of foraging movements. And these aspects of foraging movements actually was boosted up around 15 years ago by this, I think, or, not originally, but at least by this publication in Nature. And this later on came to be the levy flight or, for, or levy foraging hypothesis. And what this hypothesis suggests that when animals don't have any information on the environment and are searching for sparse targets, they should actually combine some local movements with relatively frequent long steps. Now by step, I refer not to the sampling interval that we have, the 10 minutes interval, but actually to the direction, the, the line I'm taking. This will be one step until I'm reorienting and taking to another step, and this will be another step. So these steps actually show a distribution of, if you compare it to the exponential or just normal distribution that has lots or lots of short steps, but not so much, not so many long steps. So this levy or this Pareto distribution has relatively a lot of long steps. And this is a formula. Because the formula looks like that, we can look at it on a log-log scale. And this is what we'll have from now on. So we're looking on the log of the step size. So this will be, say, 10 meters, 100 meters, 1 kilometer, 10 kilometers, and so on. And on the frequency. And you can easily see that the random exponential uh, process will have a very sh a short step, a uh, short, uh, short tail, sorry, while this function with an optimal mu of 2 should have a more or less straight line decline. So this was actually a very appealing hypothesis because it suggests that these fat tail distribution are actually scale independent. It implies that you can have the same mechanism and the same distribution that the animal is sampling, sampling the steps from on a small scale and on a larger scale. And this is really intrigued a lot of studies. Uh, and I should say that initially, the, or ideally, this system should be tested only in flat terrain, no cues, no information, no memory. But it's usually applied over the all tracks. And this is an example from uh, marine predators. And you can see that, again, we are looking on the log of the frequency and the log of the spatial scale, normalized in this case. And you see that it's more or less straight lines in this case, close to the optimal mu that you would expect. And there were other examples, anything between humans, uh, recent, just two months ago in PNAS, and uh, T cells hunting for foraging. So there are various examples, usually just looking over the whole range. Uh, and we actually heard a talk uh, earlier by Pascal Lopez Lopez that it also happens in vultures. And there were many methodological critics that I won't get into it suggesting that some of these examples maybe misuse the data or, or some things like this. And I wanted to ask this question about vultures. So do vultures have fat tail distribution? And what I want you to know about vultures is that we are talking about old world vultures. It's very different than the turkey vulture that you have over here. And actually, they are obligate scavenger. And carcasses are relatively sparse. And the vultures are very mobile. They do cover wide areas to get into to find these carcasses. So on the face of it, they look like there are a suitable study system to check it, because sparse resources was one of the conditions, and it should be about foraging, and it should be something that is capable of doing long movements. And this is what we actually wanted to ask. 
So the first question is, do they actually have fat tail step size distribution? Uh, so we tracked vultures, again, using EOBS, in contrast to the newer tags that run presented in the talk that are capable of working at one hertz, where working in a point every 10 minutes. And we can download the data, as you know, and the accelerometer data was discussed. So we can relatively uh, reliably identify feeding events. And we deployed it on adults individual. And I emphasize it's adults because we don't, we don't want to have the dispersal or the natal dispersal, at least, uh, included here. And there is one limitation for having a remote download like that versus the new generation that has the GSM. And it's that if a vulture is missing, it could be dead. And in many cases, we could find the dead vultures. But it could be actually still active further away beyond our reach. And I'll show you that this is probably the case. So just as an example of how the data looks like, this is a year worth of data from one individual. And that, that's the sample size. So we have quite a lot of individuals for a year, more or less. Some of them were lost before. Some of them were tracked for a few continuous years. And in general, vultures tend to be very regional. So they have their own roost, their own colony, where they'll attend most of the nights. If you take the preferred one or the two most common ones, it will be most of the night. These are the polygons that you see here. And they'll stay in this region over here. This is the Judean Desert in Israel. And occasionally, they will go to the next region, maybe to visit friends, I don't know, maybe to forage over there. So there are some longer sub, uh, between uh, sub-regions movement. But we're interested in the long steps that I've mentioned. And as I said, usually people compare two alternative models. So the green dots are the data. And the, this is the truncated exponential. And this is the truncated Pareto, the levy walk. And you can just eyeballing it see that the levy walk seems quite suitable, although the tail is not as fat as you might expect. Uh, but generally, you can ask, OK, so you got this in one case with one study species. How general is the pattern? And I mentioned earlier that I had some work with uh, the African vultures. That's at Toshana National Park in Namibia. And in contrast to the Israeli system, which is really manipulated, and we do artificial food supply and all this stuff, this is really as natural as it can be. You know, you have lions, you have zebras, they do their thing, and the vultures eat a carcasses of free range game. And we compared the movements in, of two species uh, foraging. The sample size are lower, and the movements are actually quite similar. So I'll have them lamp together into one database, and we can ask whether these, these species actually show the same pattern as we expect. And the answer is yes, indeed. So these are the data now from Namibia, and it will be on the right side from these two species uh, from now on. And actually, it's this more or less the same pattern. And you see that the, the Pareto distribution seems more likely when you compare just these two models. Uh, and now we want to understand the why. And I think the why is, in many cases, uh, an important question. And in order to understand the why, just let me repeat the question. Uh, so I'm narrowing the question whether it is indeed motivated by optimal foraging, because this is what the levy hypothesis predict. I'm more narrow, narrowing the question a little bit. And let me show you the tracks. So this is a movie Roy made. And each individual will be a different color. And this was the first female we tracked. She was very active, crossing between regions, going up north. This was a summer. Then came a lot of individuals active in their own region, occasionally going elsewhere. And as you might expect from a soaring bird, they can use the soaring as a thermal during the summer much better. So during the summer, they had more crossing. And this was the first year of data that we had with some summer crossing, which makes sense. But then after more than a year of study, we saw this track, which is around 1,500 kilometers. It took it, this individual, around 10 days to get here, stand, stand, spend 10 days wandering over here, and then commuted back. And again, there is a lot of activity. There are now eight individuals. Most of them you can't see because the scale is too small. But that's what vultures are doing in general. And again, during the summer, you will have some crossings. And during the fall, which is not ideal in terms of thermal availability, day lengths, and using the end of data, also the tailwind. So we, can, we actually see that there is a pattern with some individuals doing a loop, the same one actually, trying to do this loop over here. Others are trying to do over here. I think the movie stops at April. Uh, and we have this pattern that 
we have a lot of movements that you can really see in what I'll call here in home range, but we have this rare behavior, but unique behavior of long range forays. So I'll mark them with LRFs from now on. And I want to emphasize we're working on adults. It's not natal dispersal. And I don't have time to go through the whole breeding cycle of the vultures, but in order to do a breeding, they actually need to stay there for almost a year. And here they stayed in their destinations for either 10 days, which is less, more or less the distance it takes, and up to two months. So it's not, at least not a successful breeding uh, dispersal. Uh, and it's a round trip. And they came back uh, into Israel. Presumably, other individuals did this one-way trip and stayed, and we lost them because we can't get the data. And we actually know that this is the case at least for one individual. And this was, unfortunately, a spy vulture that was caught in Saudi uh, a few years ago and blamed to be an Israeli spy. Uh, now we work with GSM on juveniles, and we can see that another one was caught in Sudan. This was a juvenile. That's, I don't know why they put this picture. It's Rupels, I think. Uh, but anyway, there are costs of going beyond your home range and traveling, especially in a bad neighborhood. And all the people who work on Egyptian vultures probably can tell you more about that and the troubles they suffer from in Africa. Uh, so if any of you has any connection, please, we would like to have the transmitter back. It's expensive, as you know. And more than that, this is a rare behavior that we want to quantify. So each individual counts, and the data is valuable. But let's continue with the story. So we had that the seven birds, most of them females, that did these long-range forays. And we want to understand whether these forays are actually contributing to the step size distribution. So I'm adding to the same graph the LRF data in red. And you can see that, indeed, although it is rare, it is characterized by a, fat, a more fat tail, more similar to the Levy distribution that you might expect. And so these LRF are important in the context of long-range movements. And we are actually asking whether they are motivated by optimal foraging. And it's going back to the question. So you, you can narrow down the question to whether these are actually uh, motivated by optimal foraging. And due to our tracking methods, we can actually follow the individuals. And we know where they roosted. So we can get some insight on the, what they do. And using the accelerometer data, which is critically important for my argument, we can actually identify eating events, although we haven't seen them. And now we can ask, if, what is the motivation for these long-range forays? And I'll separate here between the commuting phase, which is a clearly directional flight, presumably in form, because they end up in many cases in a colony elsewhere, and what they do here during the wandering phase. Uh, and my initial, or our initial assumption was that it's not about food. I haven't told you about the feeding regime in Israel, but they do give a lot of frequent, diverse, rich food for vultures, as much as the population needs, and even more than that. Uh, so we, see, we thought it shouldn't be the, the, the reason. And if we look on the travel distance, that's just how many kilometers they travel per day. And we look during the commuting phase, when they are in a rush to get there or rushing back, they indeed cross around 200 kilometers or up to 200 kilometers. More surprisingly, is also during the wandering phase, they actually travel long distances compared to what they will do when they are back home or what other individuals are doing in the same season. So you can account for the seasonal pattern. And it turns out that it's quite expensive in terms of how, much, how many kilometers you have to fly because nobody fits you there, so you actually have to search over longer distances. Now, if you compare the ODBA that was mentioned earlier as a proxy for energy expenditure and the feeding rate that you can estimate from the, uh, from the accelerometer data, you can get some kind of balance. Do they get more energy? Do they expend more energy? And it turns out that they actually don't get more energy when they are over there, and they actually spend a lot of energy when they are over there compared to their feeding frequency. So it seems that this higher uh, expenditure not compensated by higher uh, intake at the destination. So if you look at it, it seems that optimal foraging cannot be the answer. They don't do it. They don't get more energy. They do it in a non-ideal timing, despite the lack of suitable thermals or good ta uh, tailwind. And they expend more energy than actually they got. So it's not about optimal foraging. So what is it? And we tried a few alternative explanations. 
first of all, we thought maybe it's not about the energy amount, but maybe it's a missing spice. Maybe these females need calcium for the egg, or maybe something like that. But it turns out that the feeding is very diverse in Israel, and these are the different types of carcasses. It's unlikely that they can find something unique, a unique type of carcass over there that will motivate them. Maybe they like the spices. Uh, we tried a little bit to work on wind loading, which is obviously important for a soaring bird. We don't have a complete data, but we didn't find the support that LRF individuals are actually different or better, or the females are different. If anything, the females are actually heavier, and they don't compensate with uh, wider wings. So we looked a little bit about the genetic structure, and this is together with uh, Alejandro here, with, who is a postdoc in our lab. And we thought maybe there are actually migrants coming, and there will be a different signature, a genetic structure. And it turns out that it's a panmitic population, also on a larger scale, uh, but also in these samples. So these individuals do not differ in this aspect. There is no evidence here. And I mentioned already that we looked also on environmental data, especially on the weather, tailwind. And it seems that it's not an optimal, it's not a good time to do it. It's actually a, a worse time to do it. So after declining this, sorry, these explanations, I'm, I want to suggest an hypothesis. And I want to emphasize that this is an hypothesis, and I don't have the silver bullet to prove it. We can't prove it, but I think it, it's worth mentioning because it might be more general to the way we do the movement study. So what I think is going on is that what we see is actually non-successful dispersal events. Some individuals, some females in this case, males in the, in the other system, are actually not happy with the situation back home, although the population is balanced. Some of them will fly to colonies further away. Some of them will stay, and we lost them. And indeed, we lost more females than males. And some of them will not find a mate and will return back home. So they failed in their dispersal attempt, and we get this long circular journey. Now, even if this speculation is not true for this specific system, it might be worth thinking about other systems that you are working in and thinking maybe these long circular uh, forays that we see and we think about them in the context of foraging are actually not about foraging. It was attempting another motivation and it failed and it had to go back to Israel where they have a lot of food. So there are various evidence for supporting this argument. I won't show you all just because of the time limitation, but just one example. Look on the roost diversity. I mentioned that when they are at home, they will prefer their own roost and they'll spend their most of the night. Obviously, when they are commuting from here to there, they cannot do it. So the likelihood of sleeping in the same roost two nights, one after another, two consecutive nights, is very low. But even when they are in the wandering phase around Saudi there, they're actually alternating between many roosts, maybe checking the different colonies. I would say dating, but this is just a, an example. It also agrees well with an evidence we have with auxiliary eggs. So some colonies are well watched in Israel because of the conservation priority of the species. And we know that although the population is, again, no shortage in male, maybe there is an effective shortage in male because we know that many females are actually going and laying an egg on the cliff without any ability. It's not a fertilized egg or laying an egg in someone's else's nest. So maybe the females are sensing something is missing in terms of male. Maybe they are actually going down to Saudi to look for a rich Saudi and sheikh. Uh, but the, what? Yeah. Uh, so this is just a speculation. But I want to go back to the Levy hypothesis, where we actually have more solid evidence. So I showed you that vultures indeed have fat tail distribution in both study systems. I showed you that long-range forays, this unique behavior, is actually important for the tail. I didn't discuss the long-range forays in Namibia. But we actually had a very similar pattern. No sex bias, but the sample size is initially biased. Uh, and you know, with a leopard face going 1,000 kilometers, hanging around a tree for four days, flying back for four days, 1,000 kilometers, spending two weeks, going again to the same tree, 1,000 kilometers, going back and doing it three times. So it seems unlikely to be an adaptive foraging strategy. Anyway, so long range forests are actually important in the terms of this fat tail. And these long-range forays are not motivated by optimal foraging. Now, as I told you, usually people used to compare these two competing models. But recently, we got to the recognition, and it's not me, it was done before me, that we actually should may maybe use an alternative, more complicated model. 
And what I added here to the data is just a composite Brownian walk. That's like a mixture of three different distribution. And you can see that it gives a much better fit. And what this type of models suggest, that animals are actually doing a complex behavior, which makes sense. And there is a peak around with a scale of movement around 50 meters with many steps. And you can think some of them are GPS error, and some of them are just movements on the ground of the vultures. Uh, and then you have an intermediate peak around three kilometers. And it differs a little bit between the system, but the scale is a few kilometers. And this is indeed what vultures are doing. They are flying here, flying there. there is, these are local movements. And last, we have a peak with steps around 20 kilometers. And this actually includes both the long range forays that I showed you and the movements, the long movements between the different regions. And it's not necessarily just about food. But the thing is that it is a, indeed a mixture of behavior that generates this apparent fatal distribution. And presumably in many other systems where people didn't consider such an alternative model, this is also the case. So just to summarize, first, I think that although fatal distribution are common in nature, and they are common in my study site with two different systems and uh, two different and three different species, we don't, we reject the foraging hypothesis, the levy foraging hypothesis in this case. And it was not supported by the long range forays being motivated by other reasons than optimal foraging and by the better fit that they correlated as a composite Brownian walk actually offer. Now, more generally, I think that it's unrealistically uh, expectation, unrealistic expectation, sorry, that all the complexities that we see in animal movements, and you are all aware of it, can be actually represented by one generating function sampling from one random distribution. And this goes back to some of the calls in the literature that you can actually cannot apply this theory like that. And this is what people are doing. You should actually limit the levy hypothesis just to the case where you have an animal in a flat terrain with no knowledge and no information and no signals. And this is obviously not true for most on any organisms that we study. And just a la last major comment that Karl Popper told us already 100 years ago or so that there is an inverse problem. You see a pattern and you, f you suggest a mechanism and there is a fit. That's not a good evidence because many other alternative mechanisms could generate the same pattern. And we should actually work harder and look for alternative data sets. And what I tried to do here using the accelerometer data, but you can think about any other data set, is to say, OK, there is a fit in terms of the movement. But you should look for other evidence. In, the, in this case, the, uh, the quality of the foraging that you can get from another aspect. And then only when you have alternative data sets supporting the same mechanism, then you can really get an insight on the mechanism. And this is true probably not just for this problem. It's true not just for curve fitting problems, but also for other aspects in biology where we have a pattern and we think we know the mechanism just by one evidence. So thank you for the finding agency and for all the people who worked and for my family. And thank you for listening. Okay. 